Well, good morning to everyone. If you will, open in your New Testaments with me to Colossians chapter 4, fourth chapter, the letter to the Colossians. As you're turning there, I want to focus on the fact that this morning we have a very application-based lesson. And like Gary, I listen to what preachers say too, and sometimes I'm kind of weirded out, to be honest, when I hear that this is going to be an application-based lesson because it makes me think, what was I listening to before this moment? But nonetheless, uh, I'm going to pay attention to that moment. And so, Gary, just for you, I want you to know, I just have a few quick thoughts this morning to share with everyone. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul is concluding a lot of important instruction. This includes certainly chapter 1, the idea that in verse 13 and 14, the kingdom of God is open. That because of the blood of Jesus, we can participate and share in salvation, in the church. And that's an amazing blessing. In Colossians chapter 2, certainly we understand that we're no longer bound by the old law. Why and when? Because of the cross, when Jesus died, those decrees that were against us, the old law was certainly nailed there as well. And so what do we do with that? Well, in chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, we set our mind on things above, not on things of the earth, but rather living towards and for that spiritual kingdom. And we come to chapter 4, and there's some application. But Paul, beginning in verse 7, starts talking about a lot of things that, if I'm honest, and I don't think I'm the only one in the room, starts reading this and going, well, maybe this isn't the most important part of the gospel message. And yet, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's here for us today. So let's read beginning in verse 7, what sometimes might be skipped over. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell of you everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf, in his prayers you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Think about verse 17. Say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. It's interesting, we read a lot of those names, and a lot of those names have weird consonants next to each other, so we tend to not be interested in that. And then we think, well, these are for people that aren't me, and so I'm not really interested in that. And we lose a lot of verses of inspired Scripture. And so we also think, well, in Colossians chapter 1, if the kingdom is open, if we are part of that, both as a local body of Christians and certainly in the universal body of Christ, we need to be working together. And so the question isn't, do we do good things? It's, how do I find my place? And so very practically this morning, we're going to look at this list of people that Paul, the inspired apostle, has specifically called out and what we can learn. And how do I find my role and find my place? Now, again, one more preacherism just to get us started and to check off all three bingos, is to say, well... There's going to be six different examples. And so I want everyone to pick at least one. Now, I'm going to cheat about halfway down and say pick two. But for right now, be looking for one. Just one thing. If you already do this, great. Add one more. If you don't know where your place is and you're starting from scratch, that's great. Just start with one. We're going to go through and look at some of what Paul did. If you have a marker, Colossians chapter 4 is going to be a great place to drop that in. First of all, notice what Paul says about Tychicus. In verse 7 again, Tychicus will tell you about all my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Now, verse 7 says a lot. Can you imagine if Paul spoke about you or I that way to say he is a fellow servant in the Lord? That the great esteemed apostle Paul is saying he is a hard worker. He is an effective worker in the kingdom of Christ. What What a blessing, what a compliment that would be. But it's not just that he's great or that he's the best speaker or that he's served the longest as an elder or that he's a great deacon or he's a good Bible class teacher. Notice verse 8, I have sent him to you for this very purpose. What is it? That you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Isn't that interesting? 
When we make a list of who is going to be at the top, who is going to serve Jesus, when we say, what is my place in the church going to be, you know what we immediately do, because we're in an American society, we start thinking of offices, right? Well, who's at the top of the office? Well, certainly Jesus is the head of the church. No one's going to be competing there. If you are, i got really bad news for you. You're going to lose. Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. But then we think, okay, well, obviously Jesus isn't like us. And so we say, well, there's elders, Right? There are the wives of the elders. That is what we should strive to be. And yes, that's true. We should be striving to be pleasing servants of God. When we read 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, what do you see in those qualifications for elders? Strong spiritual servants. Descriptions of what a strong child of God looks like. And so we should be working to be in that mold. But then we think, okay, there's also deacons. There's also Bible class teachers. There's the preacher. There's the special servants around the church. And we think of all that. And Paul says, here is this faithful minister, fellow servant of the Lord. And you know why I sent him to you in verse 8? That he may encourage your hearts. Isn't that fascinating? The way Paul and God looks at the church sometimes, if we're not careful, doesn't align with the way we do. Paul says what this church needs, what this church body of Christians needs, is someone to be an encouragement. So here's the question, what does that look like and can I do it? Well, the second one is, yes, I can do that. So what does it look like? It's kind of interesting. If I were to ask everyone if they have a phone and just raise your hand, I think everyone's hand would go up. And it better because we're in church. You don't want to be lying in church. But you know what's crazy about our phones is that if you dial a number and press send, it calls somebody. It's not just for texting and for checking email. You know, sometimes encouragement comes in the form of being with someone. It means being at worship, yes, being a part of the assembly. It means making sure that we show up at someone's door when they have a need, bringing something that might be helpful or useful. And certainly sending a text message, an email, writing a card is so valuable. But you know what else is interesting and helpful? When someone is there to talk or even just to listen. That is an encouragement. And here's the question. If we all have the phones and we all can speak and listen, who can't do this? Every one of us can. We can be like this. Notice in verse 9, And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Part of the problem with being an encourager is sometimes we're so caught up in all the negative things that if we do talk, if we do press send on the phone then all of a sudden we don't really have anything encouraging to say. Paul says they're going to bring you what? They're going to bring you good news. And so here's the question, what am I plugged into in this life, in this world, that I could share with someone and it be an encouragement? What is that good news? i got to tell you all, when Florida played LSU in football this past year, they lost because one player threw his shoe. Now there were a lot of you who were ready to talk to me about that moment. And that is not an encouragement. That is in violation of Colossians 4. I hope you're happy. <laughs> That's awesome. When we think about Colossians chapter 4 and encouragement, though, he's saying he has news. He has something good. He is going to bring you something that will uplift you. And so if I don't have anything noteworthy, upworthy in my life to share, how am I going to not only be happy myself, be an encouragement to my family, let alone reach out and be one to you? So where do we go? Well, we should certainly be counting our blessings for one. We should be thankful in all things. That's clear in 1 Thessalonians 5, Philippians chapter 4. But if nothing else, where is their good news? We're holding it. right? Those phones that call people also have Bibles on them. We can see that there is good news, that this world isn't what it's all about. And so, yes, I might have a really tough hand right now, this day, this week, this month, this decade. But you know I know who cares for me? It's Jesus. And sometimes when I'm going through a tough time, you know all I need to hear and know is that somebody sees and cares for me. And when I make that sending phone call, when I write out that card, when I show up on someone's doorstep or they show up on mine, it makes an impact. Because not only do we need to be an encouragement, the truth is we all need encouragement. And so if Paul says, hey, this is important enough to call out an inspired scripture in a letter that's going to be not only read in this church, but in the church of Laodiceans, then that's something I should be paying attention to as well. And again, you continue working through the list and you see 
I need to work like Aristarchus. Now, I got to say, if I'm making a list of traits that we need, I don't think the top of my list from scratch would have been encourager and worker. And yet, here's Paul. It's in verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And by the way, here's verse 11 again. They have been a comfort to me. You see, Paul really seems to care about this encouragement and comfort part. You know, sometimes we get uncomfortable when we start talking about what is our role in the kingdom, and we say, that sounds a little bit fluffy, right? That doesn't sound like you're just being a great prophet. What we all need to be is we need to train our sons to be prophets. We need to send our daughters to be essentially prophetesses, right? We see some of that in the New Testament, and that's just not the New Testament picture. Not everyone has that outspoken front-of-the-line role, and yet Paul recognizes this is critical. They have been a comfort to me. And by the way, where are they workers? In verse 11, the theme of Colossians, really. Workers for the kingdom of God. And so sometimes it's literally just about being a part of the work. And you say, well, I'm just not that important. Look at me in Ephesians chapter 4. I am, we are all individually that important. We are, and we know that for two reasons. Number one, Jesus died for our sins. We've talked about this before. You know how you know the worth of something? But someone will pay for it. God shed the blood of Jesus for your soul. And for my soul. And by the way, there's a part of the plan. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. You and I are part of this plan. Again, this is a letter to the Ephesians. This is the church at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, notice what God has given us. Now, verse 11 is a little bit more what we would think of, or at least I would think of, making a list of what is my role. But it goes beyond just verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until... We all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, now notice this in verse 16, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, this is fascinating because we have to reach one of two conclusions. Either Jesus is the head or he's the joints. Now, Ephesians chapter 1 makes this very clear. I think most of the New Testament makes it clear. Is Jesus the joints or the head? He's the head. He is the head of the church. In fact, that he is our goal in verse 15. What are we trying to grow into? Into him who is the head, that is Christ. And so verse 16, what does that lead? Who is making up the body of Christ? If Christ is the head, who's left? It's you and me. And we are necessary. For what goal? What purpose? Well, if you look at verse 13, 14, and 15, it is to grow in love. It is to grow to mature manhood that when the storms of life come, and they will, that I'm ready to stand. I am like Jesus would talk about in the parable of the good foundation in Matthew chapter 7. The one who heard the words of Jesus and did them is like the man who built his foundation on the rock. And the storms went and they came and they beat upon that house and it stood. Unlike the house that was on the sand that fell because they heard but did not do. Now you think about verse 16 again. It's joined and held together by every joint. And so what is the only way that this body can grow so that it builds itself up in love. Look at the middle phrase of verse 16. When each part is working properly. You see, it doesn't say when most people are working properly. It doesn't say when, you know, the elders are doing well or when the preacher's doing good or when the Bible class teachers are doing well. When each part is working properly. That means two things, by the way, and let's be very clear on one of them. This is an assumption of Paul in both Ephesians and Colossians. It means, number one, I am part of a local body that has evangelists, apostles, prophets, shepherds, and teachers, depending on the time period. So if I'm floating around, I don't qualify to participate in a local church like this. That's a problem from a New Testament perspective. But that's the obvious one. The second one is when I look at verse 16, I have to not only just have my name on a roll somewhere, I have to be doing something. I have to be a part of the work. So what does that look like? Well, for you and me, it might be different. Aristarchus was a fellow worker in the kingdom. Tychicus was an encourager. But you notice Aristarchus wasn't just some sort of hard worker. He comforted Paul. How? Well, probably by being with him. But certainly by what was Tychicus's message? 
sharing the good news, showing something worthy of encouragement. My job is to serve. How can I serve? Well, if we look around, there's any number of ways to serve just literally here on property. Isn't that kind of amazing? I mean, we don't even have to look far. There's outside work, there's inside work, there's teaching, there's organizing. We got a VBS effort coming up, and that takes way more preparation than can even be mentioned with just a few thoughts, right, Gary? And as we think about what is going on with just that one effort, or how about our gospel meeting last week, or how about our Bible class curriculum, or all that goes on, there are countless thankless roles. The question is, am I choosing to participate in them? Here's the one I said I was going to cheat on. If you'll go back to Colossians chapter 4 with me, in verse 12 and 13, certainly we understand it's important to work hard, it's important to be an encourager, we understand that. But when it comes to verse 12 and 13, this is that one that, if I'm maybe not good at the, the other five, this is one i got to start right now. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. This is interesting in verse 12. Epaphras, I think the best description of him is servant of Christ Jesus. That's certainly the most important. But this next phrase, he's always, he doesn't say always praying for you. That's not what Paul wrote. Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may what, by the way? Here's our same word from Ephesians chapter 4. That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Isn't that interesting that Paul notes this kind of synchronization between what we need in Ephesians 4 with what Epaphras is praying for? I got to say, in, in, a, in a complimentary way, Koshka and I are just thrilled to be a part of a church that is such a family. And then anytime something happens, and over the course of this particular year, a lot has happened. And people are always stepping up to serve and to pray. Love that. Love that the women have a, a I think it's monthly prayer service on a Thursday evening. That's, that's wonderful. That is awesome. But as individuals, even in our homes and in our individual prayer lives, we need to say, this is something I can do. And it's not just to pray, to check it off. He is, notice that word again in verse 12. This is so pivotal. Struggling on your behalf in his prayers. This is a concerted effort. This is, there is a need, and I am someone who can fill that need, not because I am awesome, because I am Superman, because I know what everyone needs, and I have the time, money, and resources to make it happen, but because God will take care of his servants. And if I believe that, if I believe that prayer works, and I'm not praying for you, what does that say about me? It means either my faith isn't what it should be, or I don't care for you the way that I should. Now, does that mean at all times and all ways we go down our, our quick list that Richard has sent us out on an email and we pray for every single name? No. Although I'll say there are worse habits to be in. But maybe we take a time each day or each week and say, Monday night, I'm going to make sure I say a prayer for the Cobb Heights family. I'm going to say a prayer for... Koshka Klein, she's married to Greg. That's got to be a tough road to hoe. We find someone to pray for because, remember, we're people who need encouragement. We need people who need to be comforted. We certainly then need God's hand. Praying is something that we can accomplish right now, and it's not just praying for illnesses and sicknesses. That's vital. That's important. That's a good thing. But what is he praying for again in verse 12? That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. We pray that our efforts in the kingdom and with regards to evangelism are fruitful. That there are those who will respond. And that in this church, that I can grow. That the shepherds can grow. The deacons can grow. The Bible class teachers. The Bible class students can grow. Isn't that a wonderful thing that we have a God who knows and cares about that? That's a blessing. But if we don't access that blessing, it's wasted. And so this is one of those things we can add right now. We, we should be able to start on this right here, right now, today. And so we think about Colossians chapter 4, there's even more. Notice in verse 15. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. I know we skipped a verse, we're going to come back to it. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Now there's a lot about the New Testament pattern that we sometimes either don't highlight or, or think about, but notice where is this church obviously meeting, at least in part, if not whole? In her home. And so we recognize something here that is hospitality is happening. Look at me in Hebrews chapter 13. There is this hosting. And before we go too far with that, let's notice some other New Testament context. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1. 
And you think about the Hebrew writer, what's he writing? He's writing to a group of Hebrews who are thinking about deserting Jesus to go back to Judaism. Well, what's one of those poles? Well, it's either not believing in Jesus or I want that community that I used to have. I want the financial security. I want the familial security. I want to go back to the community I had. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. And so hospitality is sandwiched between verse 1 and 3, which is brotherly love should continue. And be with those who are suffering. Now, there's this very interesting phrase at the end of verse 1. Some have entertained angels unawares. Regardless of the the weird quirks to what that verse could mean historically, or even just from a practical point of view of something that may have happened in reference point, notice in verse 3 something that links back to what Jesus said. He said, remember those who were in prison as though in prison with them. It was Jesus who in Matthew chapter 25, in verse 31 through 46, talks about a judgment scene. There's going to be those separated on the right from the left. And you know what the difference was? It wasn't that they saw someone in need. There were those who were sick, hungry, thirsty, in prison. It was those who served. Because Jesus says, as you took care of one of the least of these, you did what? You took care of me. And as you neglected one of the least of these of my brothers, you have neglected me. When we think about hospitality, yes, there is a stranger connotation. There is a guest type of connotation. But really, hosting is about a time where we can make connections with people. That we show, verse 1, brotherly love, that here is a need someone has, and I'm going to lift up their need because of something that I can provide. Whether that's a house, or a meal, or a conversation, or yes, all of the above. Think about that for a moment. Why is hosting so important from a biblical point of view? Why is there so much about hospitality? Obviously, it goes beyond having a couple from church that you're friends with or a family or someone in the community or your neighbor over. It's not just about having someone through your house. What is it about? Well, verse 1 and 3, again, highlight this. Brotherly love. Verse 3 is about doing what? Loving someone as yourself. Here's someone in prison. I am not. And how am I to view them? as though in prison with them. Why? Since you're all in the body. This is a challenge for me because maybe the other ones are character traits that I can can kind of tweak a little bit. I can get a little bit stronger at that. I can learn to pray. I can make myself do that right now. I can learn to be an encourager. I can try to focus on good things. I can be a hard worker. I can serve wherever there's an opportunity. But this seems a little bit excessive or hard. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe this isn't for everyone. Nympha is the one hosting the church in her house, not everybody else. So let's start there. But can I reach out? Can I be someone who is striving to make these connections to where I can provide encouragement? Where I can be someone who gives comfort? Who is a positive example? These moments for the first century church who came out of Judaism or came out of pagan idolatry, they would have nothing and nobody in many cases if they committed fully to Jesus. And without this body, there was nothing. There was life of servitude to Jesus alone. And the scripture is clear in the New Testament. We are not cut out for this to be alone. This is why he intended we be part of a church family. This is why he intended that we have shepherds, because we need assistance. But it's not just the role of Jesus to make us do that. It's not just the role of elders to make people do the right thing. We have to be making these connections, and so that's one way I can start. But we skipped over verse 14. Two final points here, and the lesson will be yours this morning. In verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Now, that seems a little bit innocent, and it is, but when you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, we realize Demas, who is on the good list here, finds himself shifting. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, as Paul is literally preparing for death, he says this in verse 9 to Timothy, Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You see, Demas, who's on this good list in Colossians chapter 4, he knows what's going on. He knows the beloved brethren. He knows what it's like to be part of a church. He's not there anymore. Where is he? He's in love with this present world. 
He left Paul behind, and he's living for himself. This is the choice this morning that we have. We need to find our place, and there's really three ways to go about it. There's the way that says, I'm just going to do nothing. I'm just going to keep on and hope it kind of autopilots into success. Here's the bad news for that. There is no autopiloting into success. That is not an option, so we're going to take that one off the board. Then there is, I'm going to try to serve others, lift them up, be an encouragement, be a worker, be a prayer warrior struggle on behalf of others, host others. Or, what is the other alternative that Demas presents? I'm going to live for myself. I'm just going to do what's easy for me. I'm going to do what's comfortable for me. And so when my brother has a problem, when Paul has this issue, he's telling Timothy, come quickly, because verse 10, Demas won't, because he's following his own desires. See, this is what finding my place is about. Am I willing to call Jesus Lord and do whatever he says, or am I going to live for me? I think one thing that we can all do, starting right now with our final point in the lesson this morning, is that we can be someone who gives praise and encouragement. Whether it's Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 being son of encouragement, Barnabas who would take Paul, the murdering psychopath Jew who converted to Christianity, and tell New Testament churches, you got to worship with him, he's good, I promise. Or whether we're like Aristarchus, or Epaphras, or even, yes, the encourager himself, Tychicus, We can be people who, like Paul, take the time to praise people for what they're doing, even when no one would notice. Do you know what's interesting about verse 12? Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Either Epaphras prayed in front of Paul, and so he knew that, or Paul would assume, based on his character, that's what was happening. Either way, do you think Epaphras got a lot of press for that if it wasn't for this verse? Do you think a lot of people said, oh, that Epaphras who doesn't live here and I've never met before, he's doing a great job praying for me. No, but Paul exalts him. Isn't that what this list is about? Finding my place to help everyone, Ephesians chapter four, what? Every joint with its supplied, if it's working properly, it builds itself up in love to what? Mature manhood in faith. That's what Ephesians chapter four language teaches. And so we think about praising like Paul says, hey, I have to be looking for these good deeds. And there's so many people here. I don't even begin to make a list of all the people who are serving because I see so many doing it all the time. But that's something we can do when you're behind the scenes, when you're thinking about who to call, how to write a card. Look and you'll see people serve. See who goes back to the classrooms to participate in teaching. Look who's ringing the bell. Think about who offered a prayer today about, or the wonderful eulogy that was given. Think about Bill leading singing. By the way, Bill, don't think that you took off masks when you were leading singing that that escaped me. As soon as Bill's leading singing, the mask came off. You noticed that, right? Whatever it is, we notice that which is important to us. Here's the question. Do I notice what others do? Number one. And number two, am I willing to praise them for it? You know, we talk a lot about slander and gossip, and that is destructive, it is sinful, it will lead people to hell, and it will break up families, groups, and church families in the process. But you know what doesn't? You know what does the opposite? Going behind someone's back and complimenting them. By the way, I have some good news on that. You don't have to do that behind their back. People like that. You can do it in front of them, too. But if, imagine if we were a group of people who are caught up in encouragement. That we were people who always comforted because we were looking for those opportunities and we were going to spell them out. You know what kind of person that is? That's not only someone that the world wants to be around and be like. It's someone like Jesus. Jesus made everyone around him better. Not by lowering the standard, but by setting it. And so I can find my place. There's something for me to do today. There is a role I can play. And so if I don't have a way to do that, I can ask someone who I'm sitting next to, how can I serve you? What's something I can do for this local group? What's something I can do for my local body at home, wherever I may be visiting from? There is always work in the kingdom. The question is, am I up to the challenge to be like my Lord who lived a sacrifice life? If you're here this morning, you've never become a Christian, recognize the good news of Colossians chapter one is predicated on the idea that we are in the kingdom, that yes, we can be transferred from the domain of darkness, verse 13 and 14, into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so if you've never become a Christian, you need that access into that kingdom. How do we do that? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Confess him as Lord and all that that entails. Repent of your sins, recognizing we need to put self last, God first and others in between. And be baptized, having your sins washed away, you can become a Christian. Or maybe you're here and you've been a Christian, it's been difficult because we've tried to autopilot and that doesn't work. 
Like Demas, I've lived for self, and that fails too. I want to be like my Lord, and that means I'm willing to confess my sins. I'm willing to do whatever it takes starting today to find my place and to please my God. We're here for you. We love you, and one thing we can do for one another is pray and struggle in prayers on your behalf and on our behalf. If we can help you in any way, come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song.